How to Analyse People on Site by Elsie Lincoln Benedict and Ralph Payne Benedict Human Analysis The X-Ray Modern science has proved that the fundamental traits of every individual are indelibly stamped in the shape of his body, head, face and hands. An X-ray by which you can read the characteristics of any person on sight. The most essential thing in the world to any individual is to understand himself. The next is to understand the other fellow. For life is largely a problem of running your own car as it was built to be run, plus getting along with the other drivers on the highway. From this book you are going to learn which type of car you are, and the main reasons why you have not been getting the maximum of service out of yourself. Also, you are going to learn the makes of other human cars, and how to get the maximum of cooperation out of them. This cooperation is vital to happiness and success. We come in contact with our fellow men in all the activities of our lives, and what we get out of life depends, to an astounding degree, on our relations with them. Reaction to Environment The greatest problem facing any organism is successful reaction to its environment. Environment, speaking scientifically, is the sum total of your experiences. In plain United States, this means fitting vocationally, socially and maritally into the place where you are. If you don't fit, you must move or change your environment to fit you. If you can't change the environment and you won't move, you will become a failure, just as tropical plants fail when transplanted to the Nevada desert. Learn from the sagebrush. But there is something that grows and keeps on growing in the Nevada desert, the sagebrush. It couldn't move away, and it couldn't change its waterless environment, so it did what you and I must do if we expect to succeed. It adapted itself to its environment, and there it stands, each little stalwart shrub a reminder of what even a plant can do when it tries. Moving won't help much. Human life faces the same alternatives that confront all other forms of life, of adapting itself to the conditions under which it must live, or becoming extinct. You have an advantage over the sagebrush, in that you can move from your city or state or country to another, but after all, that is not much of an advantage. For though you may improve your situation slightly, you will still find that in any civilised country the main elements of your problem are the same. Understand yourself and others. So long as you live in a civilised or thickly populated community, you will still need to understand your own nature and the natures of other people. No matter what you desire of life, other people's aims, ambitions and activities constitute vital obstructions along your pathway. You will never get far without the cooperation, confidence and comradeship of other men and women. Primitive Problems it was not always so, and its recentness in human history may account for some of our blindness to this great fact. In primitive times, people saw each other rarely and had much less to do with each other. The human element was then not the chief problem. Their environmental problems had to do with such things as the elements, violent storms, extremes of heat and cold, darkness, and the ever-present menace of wild beasts, whose flesh was their food, yet who would eat them first, unless they were quick in brain and body. Civilizations Changes But all that is changed. Man has subjugated all other creatures, and now walks the earth, its supreme sovereign. He has discovered and invented and builded, until now we live in skyscrapers, talk around the world without wires, and by pressing a button turn darkness into daylight. Causes of Failure Yet with all our knowledge of the outside world, 99 lives out of every hundred are comparative failures. The reason is plain to every scientific investigator. We have failed to study ourselves in relation to the great environmental problem of today. The stage setting has been changed, but not the play. The game is the same old game. You must adjust and adapt yourself to your environment, or it will destroy you. Mastering his own environment 
The cities of today look different from the jungles of our ancestors, and we imagine that because the brain of man overcame the old menaces, no new ones have arisen to take their place. We no longer fear extermination from cold. We turn on the heat. We are not afraid of the vast oceans which held our primitive forebears in thrall, but pass swiftly, safely, and luxuriously over their surfaces. And soon we shall be breakfasting in New York and dining the same evening in San Francisco. Facing New Enemies But in building up this stupendous superstructure of modern civilization, man has brought into being a society so intricate and complex that he now faces the new environmental problem of human relationships. The Modern Spider's Web Today we depend for life's necessities almost wholly upon the activities of others. The work of thousands of human hands and thousands of human brains lies back of every meal you eat, every journey you take, every book you read, every bed in which you sleep, every telephone conversation, every telegram you receive, every garment you wear. And this fellow man of ours has multiplied since that dim distant dawn into almost two billion human beings, with at least one billion of them after the very things you want, and not a tenth enough to go around. Adapt or die. Who will win? Nature answers for you. She has said with awful and inexorable finality that, whether you are a blade of grass in the Nevada desert or a man in the streets of London, you can win only as you adapt yourself to your environment. Today our environmental problem consists largely of the other fellow. Only those who learn to adapt themselves to their fellows can win great or lasting rewards. Externals indicate internal nature. To do this it is necessary to better understand our neighbours, to recognise that people differ from each other in their likes and dislikes traits, talents, tendencies, and capabilities. The combination of these makes each individual's nature. It is not difficult to understand others, for with each group of these traits there always goes its corresponding physical makeup, the externals whereby the internal is invariably indicated. This is true of every species on the globe, and of every subdivision within each species. Significance of size, shape, and structure. All dogs belong to the same species. But there is a great difference between the nature of a St. Bernard and that of a terrier, just as there is a decided difference between the natures of different human beings. But in both instances, the actions, reactions, and habits of each can be accurately anticipated on sight by the shape, size, and structure of the two creatures. Differences in breed. When a terrier comes into the room, you instinctively draw away, unless you want to be jumped at and greeted effusively. But you make no such movement to protect yourself from a St. Bernard, because you read on sight the different natures of these two from their external appearance. You know a rose, a violet, a sunflower and an orchid, and what perfume you are sure to find in each, by the same method. All are flowers and all belong to the same species, just as all human beings belong to the same species. But their respective size and shape and structure tell you in advance and on sight what their respective characteristics are. The same is true of all human beings. They differ in certain fundamentals, but always and invariably in accordance with their differences in size, shape and structure. The Instinct of Self-Preservation the reason for this is plain. Goaded by the instinct of self-preservation, man, like all other living things, has made heroic efforts to meet the demands of his environment. He has been more successful than any other creature is, and as a result, the most complex organism on the earth. But his most baffling complexities resolve themselves into comparatively simple terms once it is recognised that each internal change brought about by his environment brought with it the corresponding external mechanism without which he could not have survived. Interrelation of Body and Brain 
So today we see man a highly evolved creature who not only acts but thinks and feels. All these thoughts, feelings and emotions are interrelated. The body and the mind of man are so closely bound together that whatever affects one affects the other. All instantaneous change of mind instantly changes the muscles of the face. A violent thought instantly brings violent bodily movements. Movies and Face Muscles The moving picture industry, said to be the third largest in the world, is based largely on this interrelation. This industry would become extinct if something were to happen to sever the connection between external expressions and the internal nature of men and women. Tells Fundamentals How much do external characteristics tell about a man? They tell, with amazing accuracy, all the basic fundamental principal traits of his nature. The size, shape and structure of a man's body tell more important facts about his real self, what he thinks and what he does, than the average mother ever knows about her own child. Learning to read If this sounds impossible, if the seeming incongruity, multiplicity and heterogeneity of human qualities have baffled you, remember that this is exactly how the print in all books and newspapers baffled you before you learned to read. Not long ago I was reading stories aloud to a three-year-old. She wanted to see the pictures, and when told there were none, had to be shown the book. What funny little marks, she cried, pointing to the print. How do you get stories out of them? Printing looked to all of us, at first, just masses of meaningless little marks. But after a few days at school, how things did begin to clear up. It wasn't a jumble after all. There was something to it. It straightened itself out until the funny little marks became significant. Each of them had a meaning, and the same meaning under all conditions. Through them your whole outlook on life became deepened and broadened, all because you learned the meaning of twenty-six little letters and their combinations. Reading People Learning to read men and women is a more delightful process than learning to read books, for every person you see is a true story, more romantic and absorbing than any ever bound in covers. Learning to read people is also a simpler process than learning to read books, because there are fewer letters in the human alphabet. Though man seems to the untrained eye a mystifying mass of funny little marks, he is not now difficult to analyse. Only a few feelings. This is because there are, after all, but a few kinds of human feelings. Some form of hunger, love, hate, fear, hope or ambition gives rise to every human emotion and every human thought. Thoughts bring actions. Now our actions follow our thought. Every thought, however transitory, causes muscular action which leaves its trace in that part of the physical organism which is most clearly allied to it. Physiology and Psychology Interwoven Look into the mirror the next time you are angry, happy, surprised, tired or sorrowful and note the changes wrought by your emotions in your facial muscles. Constant repetition of the same kinds of thoughts or emotions finally make permanent changes in that part of the body which is physiologically related to these mental processes. The Evolution of the Jaw The jaw is a good illustration of this alliance between the mind and the body. Its muscles and bones are so closely allied to the pugnacity instinct centre in the brain that the slightest thought of combat causes the jaw muscles to stiffen. Let the thought of any actual physical encounter go through your mind, and your jawbone will automatically move upward and outward. After a lifetime of combat, whether by fists or words, the jaw is set permanently into a nature more upward and outward, a little more like that of a bulldog. It keeps to this combative mould, because, says Mother Nature, the great efficiency expert, if you are going to call on me constantly to stiffen that jaw, I'll fix it so it will stay that way, and save myself the trouble. 
Inheritance of Acquired Traits Thus the more combative jaw, having become permanent in the man's organism, can be passed on to his children. Right here comes a most interesting law, and one that has made possible the science of human analysis. Law of Size The larger any part or organ, the better its equipment for carrying out the work of that organ, and the more does it tend to express itself. Nature is an efficiency expert, and doesn't give you an oversupply of anything without demanding that you use it. Jaws becoming smaller Our ancestors developed massive jaws as a result of constant combat. As fast as civilization decreased the necessity for combat, nature decreased the size of the average human jaw. Meaning of the big jaw but wherever you see a large protruding jaw, you see an individual, armed and engined, as Kipling says, for some kind of fighting. The large jaw always goes with a combative nature, whether it is found on a man or a woman, a child, a pugilist or a minister. Exhibit A. The Irishman The large jaw, therefore, is seen to be both a result and a cause of certain things. As the inheritance of a fighting ancestor, it is the result of millions of years of fighting in prehistoric times, and like any other overdeveloped part or organ, it has an intense urge to express itself. This inherent urge is what makes the owner of that jaw fight at the drop of a hat, and often have a chip on his shoulder. Natural Selection Thus, because every external characteristic is the result of natural laws, and chiefly of natural selection, the vital traits of any creature can be read from his externals. Every student of biology, anatomy, anthropology, ethnology, or psychology is familiar with these facts. Built to Fit Man's organism has developed, altered, improved, and evolved down through the slow revolving years, with one instinctive aim, successful reaction to its environment. Every part has been laboriously constructed to that sole end. Because of this, its functions are marked as clearly upon it as those of a grain elevator, a steamship or a piano. Survival of the fittest. Nature has no accidents. She wastes no material, and everything has a purpose. If you put up a good fight to live, she will usually come to your rescue, and give you enough of whatever is needed to tide you over. If you don't, she says you are not fit to people the earth, and lets you go without a pang. Thus she weeds out all but the strong, and evolution marches on. Causes of Racial Characteristics this inherent potentiality for altering the organism to meet the demands of the environment is especially noticeable in races, and is the reason for most racial differences. Differences in environment, climate, altitude and topography necessitated most of these physical differentiations which today enable us to know at a glance whether a man belongs to the white race, the yellow race or the black race. The results of these differentiations and modifications will be told in the various chapters of this book. Types Earlier Than Races The student of human analysis reads the disposition and nature of every individual with ease regardless of whether that individual be an American, a Frenchman, a Kafir or a Chinaman, because human analysis explains those fundamental traits which run through every race, colour and nationality, according to the externals which go with those traits. Five Biological Types Human analysis differs from every other system of character analysis, in that it classifies man for the first time into five types according to his biological evolution. It deals with man in the light of the most recent scientific discoveries. It estimates each individual according to his human qualities rather than his character or so-called moral qualities, 
In other words, it takes his measure as a human being and determines from his externals his chances for success in the world of today. These rules work. Every rule in this book is based on scientific data and has been proved to be accurate by investigation and surveys of all kinds of people in all parts of the world. These rules do not work merely part of the time. They work all the time, under all conditions, and apply to every individual of every race, every colour, every country, every community, and every family. Through this latest human science, you can learn to read people as easily as you read books, if you will take a little time and pains to learn the rules which compose your working alphabet. Do what we want to do. It is easy to know what an individual will do under most circumstances because every human being does what he wants to do in the way he prefers to do it most of the time. If you doubt it, try this test. Bring to mind any intimate friends, or even that husband or wife, and note how few changes they have made to their way of doing things in twenty years. Preferences Inborn Every human being is born with preferences and predilections which manifest themselves from earliest childhood to death. These inborn tendencies are never obliterated and seldom controlled to any great extent, and then only by individuals who have learned the power of the mind over the body. Inasmuch as this knowledge is possessed only by a few, most of the people of the earth are blindly following the dictates of their inborn leanings. Follow our bents. In other words, more than 99% of all the people you know are following their natural bents in reacting to all their experiences, from the most trivial incidents to the most far-reaching emergencies. Took it from grandmother. The individual is seldom conscious of these habitual acts of his, much less of where he got them from. The nearest he comes is to say he got it from his father, or she takes it from grandmother. But where did grandmother get it? Man no mystery. Science has taken the trouble to investigate, and today we know not only where grandmother got it, but what she did with it. She got it along with her size, shape and structure, in other words, from her type. And she did just what you and everybody else does with his type characteristics. She acted in accordance with her type, just as a canary sings like a canary instead of talking like a parrot, and just as a rose gives off rose perfume instead of violet. This law holds throughout every species, and explains man, who likes to think himself a deep mystery, as it explains every other creature. The Hold of Habit Look around you, in shop, office, field or home, and you will find that the quick, alert, impulsive man is acting quickly, alertly and impulsively most of the time. Nothing less than a calamity slows him down, and then only temporarily, while the slow, patient, mild and passive individual is acting slowly, patiently, mildly and passively, in spite of all goads. Some overwhelming passion or crisis may speed him up momentarily, but as soon as it fades he reverts to his old slow habits. Significance of Fat, Bone and Muscle Human analysis is the new science which shows you how to recognise the slow man, the quick man, the stubborn man, the yielding man, the leader, the learner, and all other basic kinds of men on sight, from the shape, size and structure of their bodies. Certain bodily shapes indicate predispositions to fatness, leanness, boniness, muscularity and nervousness, and this predisposition is so much a part of the warp and woof of the individual that he cannot disguise it. The urge given him by this inborn mechanism is so strong as to be practically irresistible. Every experience of his life calls forth some kind of reaction and invariably the reaction will be similar in every vital aspect to the reactions of other people who have bodies of the same general size, shape and structure as his own. 
succeed at what we like. No person achieves success or happiness when compelled to do what he naturally dislikes to do. Since these likes and dislikes stay with him to the grave, one of the biggest modern problems is that of helping men and women to discover and to capitalise their inborn traits. Enthusiasm and Self-Expression Every individual does best those things which permit him to act in accordance with his natural bents. This explains why we like best those things we do best. It takes real enthusiasm to make a success of any undertaking, for nothing less than enthusiasm can turn on a full current. We struggle from the cradle to the grave for self-expression, and everything that pushes us in a direction opposed to our natural tendencies is done half-heartedly, inefficiently and disgruntledly. These are the steps that lead straight to failure, yet failure can be avoided and success approximated by every normal person, if he will take the same precaution with his own machinery that he takes with his automobile. Learn to drive your car. If you are presented with a car by your ancestors, which is precisely what happened to you at birth, you would not let an hour go by without finding out what make or type of car it was. Before a week elapsed, you would have taken the time, labour and interest to learn how to run it, not merely any old way, but the best way for that particular make of car. Five Makes of Human Cars There are five types of human cars, differing as definitely in size, shape and structure as Fords differ from Pierce Arrows. Each human type differs as widely in its capacities, possibilities and aptitudes as a Ford differs from a Pierce Arrow. Like the Ford or Pierce Arrow, the externals indicate these functions with unfailing accuracy. Furthermore, just as a Ford never changes into a Pierce, nor a Pierce into a Ford, a human being never changes his type. He may modify it, train it, polish it or control it somewhat, but he will never change it. Cannot be deceived The student of human analysis cannot be deceived as to the type of any individual any more than you can be deceived about the make of a car. One may doll up a Ford to his heart's content, remove the hood and top, and put on custom-made substitutes. It is still a Ford, always will be a Ford, and you can always detect that it is a Ford. It will do valuable necessary things, but only those things it was designed to do, and in its own particular manner. Nor could a Pierce act like a Ford. Are you a Ford or a Pierce? So it is with human cars. Maybe you have been awed by the jewels and clothes with which many human Fords disguise themselves. The chances are that you have overlooked a dozen Pierces this week because their paint was rusty. Perchance you are a Pierce yourself, drawing a Ford salary because you don't know you are a high-powered machine capable of making ten times the speed you have been making on your highway of life. Superficialities sway us. If so, your mistake is only natural. The world classifies human beings according to their superficialities. To the world, a human motorcycle can pass for a Rolls-Royce any day if sufficiently camouflaged with diamonds, curls, French heels and plucked eyebrows. Bicycles in Congress In the same manner, a bicycle, in human form, gets elected to Congress because he plays his machinery for all it's worth and gets a hundred percent service out of it. Every such person learned early in life what kind of car he was, and capitalised its natural tendencies. Don't judge by veneer. Nothing is more unsafe than to attempt to judge the actual natures of people by their clothes, houses, religious faith, political affiliations, prejudices, dialect, etiquette or customs. These are only the veneer, 
laid on by upbringing, teachers, preachers, traditions, and other forces of suggestion. And it is a veneer so thin that trifles scratch it off. The real always there. But the real individual is always there, filled with the tendencies of his type, bending always towards them, constantly seeking opportunities to run as he was built to run, forever striving towards self-expression. It is this ever-active urge which causes him to revert in the manifold activities of everyday life to the methods, manners and peculiarities common to his type. This means that unless he gets into an environment, a vocation and a marriage which permits of his doing what he wants to do, he will be miserable, inefficient, unsuccessful and sometimes criminal. Causes of Crime That this is the true explanation of crime has been recognised for many years by leading thinkers. Two prison wardens, Thomas Tynan of Colorado and Thomas Mott Osborne of Sing Sing, effectively initiated penal reforms based upon it. Every crime, like every personal problem, arises from some kind of situation wherein instinct is thwarted by outside influence. Human analysis teaches you to recognise on sight the predominant instincts of any individual. In brief, what that individual is inclined to do under all the general situations of his life. You know what the world tries to compel him to do. If the discrepancy between these two is beyond the reach of his type, he refuses to do what society demands. This and this only is back of every human digression, from indiscretion to murder. It is as vain to expect to eradicate these inborn trends and put others in their places as to make a sewing machine out of an airplane or an oak out of a pine. The most man can do for his neighbour is to understand and inspire him. The most he can do for himself is to understand and organise his inborn capacities. Find your own type. The first problem of your happiness is to find out what type you are yourself, which you will know after reading this book, and to build your future accordingly. Knowing and Helping Others The second is to learn how to analyse others to the end that your relationships with them may be harmonious and mutually advantageous. Take every individual according to the way he was born, Accept him as that kind of mechanism, and deal with him in the manner befitting that mechanism. In this way, and this only, will you be able to impress or to help others. In this way only will you be able to achieve real success. In this way only will you be able to help your fellow man find the work, the environment and the marriage wherein he can be happy and successful. The Four C's to get the maximum pleasure and knowledge out of this interesting course, there are four things to remember as your part of the contract. Read concentratedly. Think of what you are reading while you are reading it. Concentration is a very simple thing. The next C is observe carefully. Look at people carefully, but not starefully, when analysing them. Don't jump at conclusions. We humans have a great way of twisting facts to fit our conclusion as soon as we have made one. But don't spend all of your time getting ready to decide and forget to decide at all, like the man who was going to jump a ditch. He ran so far back to get a good start each time that he never had the strength to jump when he got there. Get a good start by observing carefully. Then decide confidently. Be sure you are right and then go ahead. Make a decision and make it with the confidence that you are right. If you will determine now to follow this rule, it will compel you to follow the first two, because in order to be sure you are right, to be certain you are not misjudging anybody, you will read each rule concentratedly and observe each person carefully beforehand. Practice constantly. Practice makes perfect. Take this for your motto. 
if you would become expert in analysing people. It is one easily followed, for you come in contact with people everywhere, at home, amongst your business associates, with your friends and on the street. Remember you can only benefit from a thing as you use it. A car that you never took out of the garage would be of no value to you. So get full value out of this course by using it at all times. These rules, your tools. These rules are scientific. They are true and they are true always. They are very valuable tools for the furtherance of your progress through life. An understanding of people is the greatest weapon you can possess. Therefore, these are the most precious tools you can own. But like every tool in the world, and all knowledge in the world, they must be used as they were built to be used, or you will get little service out of them. You would not expect to run a car properly without paying the closest attention to the rules for clutches, brakes, starters and gears. Everything scientific is based not on guesses, but laws. This course in analysing people on sight is as scientific as the automobile. It will carry you far and do it easily if you will do your part. Your part consists of learning the few simple rules laid down in this book and applying them in the everyday affairs of your life. Fewer and Truer Many things which have been found to be true in almost every instance could therefore have been included in this course, but we prefer to make fewer statements and have those of bedrock certainty. Therefore this course, like all our courses, consists exclusively of those facts which have been found to be true in every particular of people in normal health. Important. The Five Extremes this book deals with pure or unmixed types only. When you understand these, the significance of their several combination as seen in everyday life will be clear to you. The Human Alphabet Just as you cannot understand the meaning of a word until you know the letters that go into the makeup of that word, you cannot analyse people accurately until you get the five extreme types firmly in your mind for they are your alphabet. Founded in five biological systems. Each pure type is the result of the overdevelopment of one of the five biological systems possessed by all human beings, the nutritive, circulatory, muscular, bony or nervous. Therefore every individual exhibits some degree of the characteristics of all the five types. The secret of individuality. But his predominant traits and individuality, the things that make him the kind of man he is, agree infallibly with whichever one of the five systems predominates in him. Combinations common in America. The average American man or woman is a combination of some two of these types, with a third discernible in the background. To analyse people. To understand human beings, familiarise yourself first with the pure or unmixed types, and then it will be easy and fascinating to spell out their combinations and what they mean in the people all about you. Postpone combinations. Until you have learned these pure types thoroughly, it will be to your advantage to forget that there is such a thing as combinations. After you have these extreme types well in mind, you will be ready to analyse combinations. The five types. Science has discovered that there are five types of human beings. Discarding for a moment their technical names, they may be called the fat people, the florid people, the muscular people, the bony people and the mental people. Each varies from the others in shape, size and structure, and is recognisable at a glance by his physique or build. This is because his type is determined by the preponderance within his body of one of the five great departments or biological systems, 
the nutritive, the circulatory, the muscular, the bony or the nervous. At birth, every child is born with one of these systems more highly developed, larger and better equipped than the others. Type never disappears. Throughout his life this system will express itself more, be more intense and constant in its functioning than the others, and no manner of training, education, environment or experience, so long as he remains in normal health, will alter the predominance of this system, nor prevent its dictating his likes, dislikes, and most of his reactions. EFFECT OF EATING if you do not understand why the overaction of one bodily system should influence man's nature, see if you can't recall more than one occasion when a square meal made a decided difference to your disposition within the space of thirty minutes. If one good meal has the power to alter so completely our personalities temporarily, is it then any wonder that constant overfeeding causes everybody to love a fat man? For the fat man is habitually and chronically in that beatific state which comes from overeating. How to Analyze People on Sight Through the Science of Human Analysis The Five Human Types by Elsie Lincoln Benedict and Ralph Payne Benedict Part 1 of Chapter 1 The Alimentive Type The Enjoyer Note, bear in mind at the beginning of this and every other chapter that we are describing the extreme or unmixed type. Before leaving this book you will understand combination types and should read people as readily as you now read your newspaper. Those individuals in which the alimentive system is more highly developed than any other are called alimentives. The alimentive system consists of the stomach, intestines, alimentary canal, and every part of the assimilative apparatus. Physical Rotundity A general rotundity of outline characterizes this type. He is round in every direction. Fat rolls away from his elbows, wrists, knees, and shoulders. See Chart 1. The Fat, Overweight Individual Soft flesh thickly padded over a small-boned body distinguishes the pure alimentive type. In men of this type the largest part of the body is around the girth. In women it is around the hips. These always indicate a large nutritive system in good working order. Fat is only surplus tissue, the amount manufactured by the assimilative system over and above the needs of the body. Fat is more soft and spongy than bone or muscle, and lends to its wearer a softer structure and appearance. Small Hands and Feet Because his bones are small, the pure alimentive has small feet and small hands. How many times have you noted with surprise that the 200-pound woman had tiny feet? The inconvenience of getting around, which you have noticed in her, is due to the fact that while she has more weight to carry, she has smaller than average feet with which to do it. The Pure Alimentive Head A head comparatively small for the body is another characteristic of the extreme alimentive. The neck and lower part of the head are covered with rolls of fat. This gives the head the effect of spreading outward from the crown as it goes down to the neck, thus giving the neck a short, disproportionately large appearance. The round-faced person A full-moon face with double or triple chins gives this man his baby face. See Chart 2. Look carefully at any extremely fat person, and you will see that his features are inclined to the same immaturity of form that characterizes his body. Very few fat men have long noses. Nearly all fat men and women have not only shorter, rounder noses, but shorter upper lips, fuller mouths, rounder eyes, and more youthful expressions than other people, in short, the features of childhood. The entire physical makeup of this type is modeled upon the circle, round hands with dimples where the knuckles are supposed to be, round fingers, round feet, round waist, round limbs, sloping shoulders, curving thighs, bulging calves, wrists, and ankles. Wherever you see curves predominating in the physical outlines of any person, that person is largely of the alimentive type and will always exhibit alimentive traits. The Man of Few Movements The alimentive is a man of unhurried, undulating movements. The difficulty in moving large bodies quickly necessitates a slowing down of all his activities. These people are easeful in their actions, make as few moves as possible, and thereby lend an air of restfulness wherever they go. Because it is difficult to turn their heads, 
extremely fat people seldom are aware of what goes on behind them. The Fat Man's Walk Very fat people waddle when they walk, though few of them realize it. They cannot watch themselves go by, and no one else has the heart to impart bad news to this pleasant person. Spilling Over Chairs The fat man spills over chairs and out of his clothes. Big armchairs, roomy divans, and capacious automobiles are veritable dykes to these men. Note the beeline the fat person makes for the big leather chair when he enters a room. Clothes for Comfort The best that money can buy are the kinds of clothes purchased by the alimentive whenever he can afford them and it often happens that he can afford them, especially if the cerebral system comes second in his makeup. If he is in middle circumstances, his clothes will be chosen chiefly for comfort. Even the rich alimentive gets into something loose, as soon as he is alone. Baggy trousers, creased sleeves, soft collars, and soft cuffs are seen most frequently on fat men. Comfort is one of the very first aims of this type. To attain it, he often wears old shoes or gloves long past their time to save breaking in a new pair. Susceptible to cold Cold weather affects this type. If you will look about you the first cold day of autumn, you will note that most of the overcoats are on the plump men. How the Fat Man Talks Never to take anything too seriously is an unconscious policy of fat people. They show it plainly in their actions and speech. The very fat man is seldom a brilliant conversationalist. He is often a jollier, and tells stories well, especially anecdotes and personal experiences. Doesn't tell his troubles. He seldom relates his troubles, and often appears not to have any. He avoids references to isms and ologies, and gives a wide berth to all who deal in them. Radical groups seldom number any extremely fat men among their numbers, and when they do it is usually for some other purpose than those mentioned in the bylaws. The very fat man dislikes argument, avoids disagreeing with you, and sticks to the outer edges of serious questions in his social conversation. The fat man lives to eat. Rich food in large quantities is enjoyed by the average fat man three times a day and 365 days a year. Between meals he usually manages to stow away a generous supply of candy, ice cream, popcorn, and fruit. We have interviewed countless popcorn and fruit vendors on the subject, and every one of them told us that the fat people kept them in business. Visits the soda fountain often. As for the ice cream business, take a look the next time you pass a soda fountain and note the large percentage of fat people joyfully scooping up mountains of sundaes, parfaits, and banana splits. You will find that of those who are sipping things through straws, the thin folks are negotiating lemonades and phosphates, while a creamy frappe is rapidly disappearing from the fat man's glass. The Deep Mystery What do you suppose is making me so plump? naively inquires the fat man when it finally occurs to him, as it did to his friends long before, that he is surely and speedily taking on flesh. If you don't know the answer, look at the table of any fat person in any restaurant, cafe, or dining room. He is eating with as much enthusiasm as if he had just been rescued from a forty-day fast, instead of having only a few hours before looked on equally generous meal in the eye, and put it all under his belt. The next time you are at an American planned hotel where meals are restricted to certain hours, note how the fat people are always the first ones into the dining room when the doors are opened. Fat Making Foods Butter, Olive Oil, Cream Pastry and starches are foods that increase your weight just as fast as you eat them, if your assimilative system is anything like it should be. Though he is the last man in the world who ought to indulge in them, the fat man likes these foods above all others, and when compelled to have a meal without them feels as though he hadn't eaten at all. Why they don't lose weight We had a friend who decided to reduce, but in spite of the fact that she lived on salads almost exclusively for a week, she kept right on gaining. We thought she had been surreptitiously treating herself to lunches between meals, until some one noticed a dressing with which she drowned her lettuce, pure olive oil, a cupful at a sitting, because, she said, I must have something tasty to camouflage the stuff. An experiment. Once in California, where no city block is complete without its cafeteria, we took a committee from one of our human analysis classes to six of these big establishments one noontime. To illustrate to them the authenticity of the facts we have stated above, we prophesied what the fat ones would select for their meals. Without exception, their trays came by heaped with pies, cake, cream, starchy vegetables, and meat, 
just as we predicted. A short life, but a merry one. According to the statistics of the United States life insurance companies, fat people die younger than others. And the insurance companies ought to know, for upon knowing instead of guessing what it is that takes us off, depends the whole life insurance business. That they consider the extremely fat man an unsafe risk after thirty years of age is a well-known fact. I am interrupted every day by salesmen for everything on earth except one. But the life insurance agents leave me alone, laughed a very fat young lawyer friend of ours the other morning. And he went on ordering ham and eggs, waffles, potatoes, and coffee. That he is eating years off his life doesn't trouble the fat man, however. He has such a good time doing it. I should worry, says the fat man. It was no accident that ish kabibble was invented by the Hebrew, for this race has proportionately more fat people in it than any other, and fat people just naturally believe worry is useless. But the fat man gets this philosophy from the same source that gives him most of his other traits, his predominating system. Digestion and Contentment the eating of delicious food is one of the most intense and poignant pleasures of life. The digestion of food, when one possesses the splendid machinery for it which characterizes the alimentive, gives a deep feeling of serenity and contentment. Since the fat man is always just going to a big meal, or in the process of digesting one he does not give himself a chance to become ill-natured, his own and the world's troubles sit lightly upon him. The Most Popular Type Socially the life of the party is the fat man, or that pleasing, adaptable, feminine creature, the fat woman. No matter what comes or goes, they have a good time, and it is such an infectious one that others catch it from them. Did you ever notice how things pick up when the fat one appears? Every hostess anticipates their arrival with pleasure, and welcomes them with relief. She knows that she can relax now, and sure enough, fatty has in his hat off till the atmosphere shows improvement. By the time Chubby gets into the parlor and passes a few of her sunny remarks, the wheels are oiled for the evening, and they don't run down till the last plump guest has said good night. So it is no wonder that fat people spend almost every evening at a party. They get so many more invitations than the rest of us. Likes Complacent People People who take things as they find them are the ones the Alimentive prefers for friends, not only because, like the rest of us, he likes his own kind of folks but because the other kind seems incongruous to him. He takes the attitude that resistance is a waste of energy. He knows others and easier ways of getting what he desires. There are types who take a lively interest in those who are different from them, but not the alimentive. He prefers easy-going, hospitable, complacent friends whose homes and hearts are always open and whose minds run on the simple, personal things. The reason for this is obvious. All of us like the people, situations, experiences, and environments which bring out our natural tendencies, which call into play those reflexes and reactions to which we tend naturally. Chooses food-loving friends. Let's have something to eat is a phrase whose hospitality has broken more ice and warmed more hearts than any other, unless perchance that rapidly disappearing let's have something to drink. The fat person keeps at the head of his list those homey souls who set a good table and excel in the art of third and fourth helpings. Because he is a very adaptable sort of individual, this type can reconcile himself to the other kind whenever it serves his purpose. But the tender spots in his heart are reserved for those who encourage him in his favorite indoor sport. When he doesn't like you A fat man seldom dislikes anybody very hard or for very long. Really disliking anybody requires the expenditure of a good deal of energy, and hating people is the most strenuous work in the world. So the Alimentive refuses to take even his dislikes to heart. He is a consistent conserver of steam, and this fact is one of the secrets of his success. He applies this principle to everything in life, so he travels smoothly through his dealings with others. Holds few grudges. Forget it is another phrase originated by the fat people. You will hear them say it more often than any other type and what is more, they excel the rest of us in putting it into practice. The result is that their nerves are usually in better working order. This type runs down his batteries less frequently than any other. Avoids the ologists. When he takes the trouble to think about it, there are a few kinds of people the Alimentive does not care for. The man who is bent on discussing the problems of the universe, the highbrow who wants to practice his new relativity lecture on him, the theorist who is given to lengthy expatiations, and all advocates of new isms and ologies, are avoided by the pure alimentive. He calls them faddists, fanatics, and fools. 
When he sees a highbrow approaching, instead of having it out with him as some of the other types would, he finds he has important business somewhere else. Thus he preserves his temperature, something that in the average fat man seldom goes far above normal. No theorist. Theories are the bane of this type. He just naturally doesn't believe in them. Scientific discoveries, unless they have to do with some new means of adding to his personal comforts, are taboo. The next time this one about fat men dying young is mentioned in his presence, listen to his jolly roar. The speed with which he disposes of it will be beautiful to see. Say, I feel like a million dollars. He will assure you if you read this chapter to him, and I'll bet the folks who wrote that book are a pair of grouches who have forgotten what a square meal tastes like. Where the T-Bones Go When you catch a three-inch steak homeward bound, you will usually find it tucked under the arm of a well-rounded householder. When his salary positively prohibits the comforts of parlor, bedroom, and other parts of the house, the fat man will still see to it that the kitchen does not lack for provender. Describes his food The fat person likes to regale you with alluring descriptions of what he had for breakfast, what he has ordered for lunch, and what he is planning for dinner and the rare bit he has on the program for after the theater. Eats his way to the grave. Most of us are committing suicide by inches in one form or another, and always in that form which is inherent in our type. The Alimentive eats his way to the grave, and has at least this much to say for it. It is more delightful than the pet weaknesses by which the other types hasten the final curtain. Diseases he is most susceptible to. Diabetes is more common among this type than any other. Apoplexy is next, especially if the fat man is also a florid man, with a fast heart or an inclination to high blood pressure. A sudden breaking down of any or several of the vital organs is also likely to occur to fat people earlier than to others. It is the price they pay for their years of overeating. Overtaxed heart, kidneys, and liver are inevitable results of too much food, so the man you call fat and husky is fat but not husky, according to the statistics. Fat Men and Influenza During the historic Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918, more fat people succumbed than all other types combined. This fact was a source of surprise, and much discussion on the part of newspapers, but not of the scientists. The big question in treating this disease and its twin, pneumonia, is, will the heart hold out? Fat seriously handicaps the heart. The Fat Man's Ford Engine The human heart weighs less than a pound but it is the one organ in all our machinery that never takes a rest. It is the engine of the human car, and what a faithful little motor too, like the Ford engine which it so much resembles. If you live to be forty, it chugs away forty years, and if you stay here ninety, it stretches it to ninety, without an instant of vacation. But it must be treated with consideration, and the first consideration is not to overwork it. A Ford engine is large enough for a Ford car, for Fords are light weight, as long as you do not weigh too much, your engine will carry you up the hills and down the dales of life with good old Ford efficiency and at a pretty good gait. Making a truck out of your Ford. But when you take on fat, you are doing to your engine what a Ford driver would be doing to his if he loaded his car with brick or scrap iron. A Ford owner who intended to transport bricks the rest of his life could get a big cylinder engine and substitute it for the original, but you can't do that. This little four-cylinder affair is the only one you will ever have, and no amount of money, position, or affection can buy you a new one if you mistreat it. Like the Ford engine, it will stand for a good many pounds of excess baggage, and still do good work. But if you load on too much and keep it there, the day will come when its cylinders begin to skip. You may take it to the service station and pay the doctors to grind the valves, fix your carburetor, and put in some new spark plugs. These may work pretty well, as long as you are traveling the paved highway of perfect health. You may keep up with the procession without noticing anything particularly wrong. But come to the hill of pneumonia or diabetes, and you are very likely not to make the grade. Don't kill your engine. The records in America show that thousands of men and women literally kill their engines every year when they might have lived many years longer. How each finds happiness. We live for happiness and each type finds its greatest happiness in following those innate urges determined by the most highly developed system in its makeup. The Alimentive's disposition, nature, character, and personality are built by and around his alimentary system. He is happiest when gratifying it, and whenever he thwarts it he is miserable, just as the rest of us are when we thwart our predominant system. The world needs him. 
this type has so many traits needed by the world however and has such extreme capacity for enjoying life that the race not to mention himself would profit greatly by his denying himself excessive amounts of food enjoyment the keynote of this type the good things of life rich abundant food and everything that serves the personal appetites are the cravings of this type he purchases and uses more of the limousines yachts and chefs than any other three types combined and gets more for his money out of them than others do the keynote of his nature is personal enjoyment his senses of touch and taste are also especially acute the fat man loves comfort you can tell a great deal about a man's type by noting for what classes of things he spends most of his extra money the alimentive may have no fire insurance no liberty bonds no real estate but he will have all the modern comforts he can possibly afford most of the world's millionaires are fat and human analysis explains why we make few efforts in life save to satisfy our most urgent demands desires and ambitions each human type differs in its cravings from each of the others and takes the respective means necessary to gratify these cravings the alimentive craves those luxuries comforts and conveniences which only money can procure for him the fat millionaire when the alimentive is a man of brains he uses his brains to get money no fat person enjoys work but the greater his brain capacity the more will he forego leisure to make money when the fat man is in average circumstances any man's money-making ambitions depends largely on whether money is essential to the satisfaction of his predominating instincts if he is fat and of average brain capacity he will overcome his physical inertia to the point of securing for himself and his family most of the comforts of modern life the average brained fat man composes a large percentage of our population and the above accounts for his deserved reputation as a generous husband and father the fat man a good provider the fat man will give his last cent to his wife and children for the things they desire but he is not inclined as much as some other types to hearken to the woes of the world at large the fat man is essentially a family man a home man a respectable cottage-owning tax-paying peaceable citizen not a reformer he inclines to the belief that other families other communities other classes and other countries should work out their own salvation and he leaves them to do it in all charitable philanthropic and community drives he gives freely but is not lavish nor sentimental about it it is often a business proposition with him when the fat man is poor love of ease is the fat man's worst enemy his inherent contentment accentuated by the inconvenience of moving about easily or quickly constantly tempts him to let things slide when he lacks the brain capacity for figuring out ways and means for getting things easily he is never a great success at anything when the extremely fat man's mentality is below the average he often refuses to work in which case he becomes a familiar figure around public restrooms parks and the cheaper hotel lobbies such a man finally graduates into the class of professional chair warmers end of part one of chapter one part two of chapter one how to analyze people on site. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. How to analyze people on site through the science of human analysis. The five human types. By Elsie Lincoln Benedict and Ralph Payne Benedict. Part two of chapter one. Fat people love leisure. A chance to do as we please, especially to do as little hard work as possible, is a secret desire of almost everybody. But the fat man takes the prize for wanting it most. Not a strenuous worker. He is not constructed to work hard like some of the other types, as we shall see in subsequent chapters. His overweight is not only a handicap in that it slows down his movements, but it tends to slow down all his vital processes as well, and to overload his heart. This gives him a chronic feeling of heaviness and inertia. Everybody likes him. But nature must have intended fat people to manage the rest of us instead of taking a hand at the heavy work. 
she made them adverse to toil, and then made them so likable that they can usually get the rest of us to do their hardest work for them. The World Managed by Fat People When he is brainy, the fat man never stays in the lower ranks of subordinates. He may get a late start in an establishment, but he will soon make those over him like him so well they will promote him to a chief clerkship, a foremanship, or a managership. Once there, he will make those under him so fond of him that they will work long and hard for him. Fat Men to the Top In this way, the fat man of real brains goes straight to the top, while others look on and bewail the fact that they do most of the actual work. They fail to recognize that the world always pays the big salaries not for hard work, but for head work, and not so much for working yourself as for your ability to get others to work. The Popular Politician This capacity for managing, controlling, and winning others is what enables this type to succeed so well in politics. The fat man knows how to get votes. He mixes with everybody, jokes with everybody, remembers to ask how the children are, and pretty soon he's the head of his ward. Almost every big political boss is fat. Makes Others Work One man is but one man, and at best can do little more than a good man-sized day of work. But a man who can induce a dozen other man-machines to speed up and turn out a full day's work apiece doesn't need to work his own hands. He serves his employer more valuable as an overseer, foreman, or supervisor. The Fat Salesman A fat drummer is such a common phrase that we would think our ears deceived us did anyone speak of a thin one. Approach five people and say, A traveling salesman? Each will tell you that the picture this conjures in his imagination is of a fat, round, roly-poly, good-natured, pretty clever man whom everybody likes. For the fat men are born salesmen, and they make up a large percentage of that profession. Salesmanship requires mentality plus a pleasing personality. The fat man qualifies easily in the matter of personality. Then, he makes little or much money from salesmanship according to his mental capacity. The Drummer's Funny Stories You will note that the conversation of fat people is well sprinkled with funny stories. They enjoy a good joke better than any other type, for reason which will become more and more apparent to you. That salesmen are popularly supposed to regale each customer with yarns till he gasps for breath, and to get his signature on the dotted line while he is in that weakened condition, is more or less of a myth. It originated from the fact that most salesmen are fat, and that fat people tell stories well. Jokes at Fat Men's Expense Look at Fatty. Get a truck! and other jibes greet the fat man on every hand. He knows he cannot proceed a block without being the butt of several jokes, but he listens to them all with amiability, surprising to the other types. And this good nature is so apparent that even those who make sport of him are thinking to themselves, I believe I'd like that man. The Fat Man's Habits Never hurry, never worry are the unconscious standards underlying many of the reactions of this type. If you will compile a list of the habits of any fat person, you will find that they are mostly the outgrowths of one or both of these motives. Won't speed up. You would have a hard time getting an alimentive to follow out of any protracted line of action calling for strenuosity, speed, or high tension. He will get as much done as the strenuous man when their mentalities are equal, and often more. The fat person keeps going in a straight line, with uniform and uninterrupted effort, 
and does not have the blowouts common to more fidgety people. But hard, fast labor is not in his line. Love's Comedy All forms of mental depression are foreign to fat people as long as they are in normal health. We have known a fat husband and wife to be ejected for rent and spend the evening at the movies laughing like four-year-olds at Charlie Chaplin or a Max Sennett comedy. You have sometimes seen fat people whose financial condition was pretty serious and wondered how they could be so cheerful. Inclined to Indolence Fat people's habits, being built around their points of strength and weakness, are necessarily of two kinds, the desirable and the undesirable. The worst habits of this type are those inevitable to the ease-loving and the immature-minded. Indolence is one of his most undesirable traits and costs the alimentive dear. In this country, where energy, push, and lightning-like efficiency are at a premium, only the fat man of brains can hope to keep up. The inertia caused by his digestive processes is so great that it is almost insurmountable. The heavy, lazy feeling you have after a large meal is with the fat man intermittently because his organism is constantly in the process of digesting large amounts of food. Likes Warm Rooms Love of comfort, especially such things as warm rooms and soft beds, is so deeply embedded in the fiber of this type that he has ever to face a fight with himself, which the rest of us do not encounter. This sometimes leads the excessively corpulent person to lax into laziness and slovenliness. An obese individual sometimes surprises us, however, by his ambition and immaculateness. But such a man or woman must always combine decided mental tendencies with his alimentativeness. Enjoys doing favors. The habits which endear the fat person to everyone and make us forget his faults are his never-failing hospitality, kindness when you are in trouble, his calming air of contentment, his tact, good nature, and the real pleasure he seems to experience when doing you a favor. His worst faults wreck upon him far greater penalties than fall upon those who associate with him, something that cannot be said for the faults of some other types. Likes Melody Simple, natural music is a favorite with fat people. Love songs, rollicking tunes, and those full of melody are most popular with him. An easy-to-learn, easy-to-sing song is one a fat man chooses when he names the next selection. They like ragtime, jazz, and music with a swing to it. Music the world over is most popular with fat races. The world's greatest singers and most of its famous musicians have been fat, or at least decidedly plump. Goes to the Cabaret the fat person will wiggle his toes, tap his fingers, swing his fork, and nod his head by the hour with a rumbling jazz orchestra. When the alimentative is combined with some other type, he will also enjoy other kinds of music, but the pure alimentative cares most for the primal tunes and melodies. Likes a girly show. A pretty girl show makes a hit with fat women as well as with fat men, Drop into the passing show and note how many fat people are in the audience. Drop into a theater the next night where a tragedy is being enacted and see how few fat ones are there. The One Made Sport Of Fat people enjoy helping out the players if the opportunity offers. All show people know this. When one of those tricks is to be played from the footlights upon a member of the audience, the girl who does it is always careful to select that circular gentleman down front. Let her try to mix up confetti or a toy balloon with a tall skinny man, and the police would get a hurry call. When we describe the bony type, you will note how very different he is from our friend the fat man. A Movie Fan the fat man's theater 
would be a more fitting name for the movie houses of the country. Not that the fat man is the only type patronizing the cinema. The movies cover in one evening so many different kinds of human interest, news, cartoons, features, and comedy that every type finds upon the screen something to interest him. But if you will do what we have done, stand at the doorway of the leading movie theaters of your city any evening and keep a record of the types that enter, you will find the plump are as numerous as all the others combined. Easy Entertainment The reason for this is plain to all who are acquainted with human analysis. The fat man wants everything the easiest possible way and the movie fulfills this requirement more fully than any other theatrical entertainment. He can drop in when he feels like it, and there is no waiting for the show to start, for one thing. This is a decided advantage to him, for fat people do not like to depend upon themselves for entertainment. The Babies of the Race The first stage in biological evolution was the stage in which the alimentary apparatus was developed. To assimilate nutriment was the first function of all life, and is so still, since it is the principal requirement for self-preservation. Being the first and most elemental of our five physiological systems, the alimentive, when it overtops the others, produces a more elemental, infantile nature. The pure alimentive has rightly been called, quote, the baby of the race, end quote. This accounts for many of the characteristics of the extremely fat person, including the fact that it is difficult for him to amuse himself. He, of all types, likes most to be amused, and very simple toys and activities are sufficient to do it. Loves the Circus A serious drama or problem play usually bores him, but he seldom misses a circus. The fat person expresses his immaturity also in that he likes to be petted, made over, and looked after. Like the infant, he demands food first. Almost the only time a fat man loses his temper is when he has been deprived of his food. The next demand on his list is sleep, another characteristic of the immature. Give a fat man three squares a day, and plenty of sleep, and a comfortable bed, and he will walk off with the prize for good humor three hundred and sixty-five days in the year. Next to sleep, he demands warm clothing in winter and steam heat when the wintry winds blow. Fat People at the Beach If it were not for the exertion required in getting to and from the beaches, dressing and undressing, and the momentary coldness of the water, many more alimentives would go to the beaches in summer than do not strenuous. Anything to be popular with the alimentive must be easy to get, easy to do, easy to get away from, easy to drop in if he feels like it, anything requiring the expenditure of great energy, even though it promises pleasure when achieved, is usually passed over by the fat people. The art of getting out of it. Let George do it, is another bit of slang invented by this type. He seldom does anything he really hates to do. He is so likable, he either induces you to let him out of it, or gets somebody to do it for him. He just naturally avoids everything that is intense, difficult, or strenuous. The Peaceable Type If an unpleasant situation of a personal or social nature arises, a quarrel, a misunderstanding, or any kind of disagreement, the fat man will try to get himself out of it without a discussion, except when they have square faces, in which case they are not pure alimentives. Extremely fat people do not mix up in their neighborhood, family, church, club, or political quarrels. It is too much trouble for one thing, and for another it is opposed to his peaceable, untensed nature. Avoids expensive quarrels. The fat man has his eye on personal advantages and promotions, and he knows that quarrels are expensive, not alone in the chances they lose him, but in nerve force and peace of mind. 
The fat man knows instinctively that peace times are the most profitable times, and though he is not for peace at any price, so far as the country is concerned, he certainly is much inclined that way where he is personally concerned. You will be amused to notice how this peace-loving quality increases as one's weight increases. The more fat any individual is, the more he is inclined to get what he wants without hostility. THE REAL THING The favorite good time of an alimentive is one where there are plenty of refreshments. A dinner invitation always makes a hit with him, but beware that you do not lure a fat person into your home and give him a tea with lemon wisp where he expected a full meal. Always ready for food. Substantial viands can be served to him any hour of the day or night with the certainty of pleasing him. He loves a banquet, provided he is not expected to make a speech. The fat man has a harder time than any other listening to long speeches. The fashion of trying to mix the two most opposite extremes, food and ideas, and expecting them to go down, was due to our misunderstanding of the real nature of human beings. It is rapidly going out, as must every fashion which fails to take the human instincts into account. Avoids Sports no prizes lure a fat man into strenuous physical exercise or violent sports, although we have witnessed numerous state, national, and international tennis, polo, rowing, sprinting, hurdling, and swimming contestants. We have not seen one player who was fat enough to be included in the pure alimentive type. The grandstands, bleachers, and touring cars at these contests contain a generous number of fat people, but their conversation indicated that they were present more from personal interest in some contestant than in the game itself. The nearest a fat man usually comes to taking strenuous exercise is to drive in an open car. The more easeful that car, the better he likes it. He avoids long walks as he would the plague, and catches a street car for a two-block trip. The Personal Element Due to his immaturity, the fat person gives little thought to anything save those things which affect him personally. The calm exterior, unruffled countenance, and air of deliberation he sometimes wears, and which have occasionally passed for judicial qualities, are largely the results of the fact that the alimentive refuses to get stirred up over anything that does not concern him personally. This personal element will be found to dominate the activities, conversation, and interests of the alimentive. For him to like a thing or buy a thing, it must come pretty near being something he can eat, wear, live in, or otherwise personally enjoy. He confines himself to the concrete and tangible. But most of all, he confines himself to things out of which he gets something for himself. Reading the fat man is no reader, but when he does read, it is nearly always something funny, simple, or sentimental. In newspapers, he reads the funnies. Magazine stories, if short and full of sentiment, attract him. He seldom reads an editorial and is not a bookworm. The newspaper furnishes practically all of the fat man's reading. He seldom owns a library unless he is very rich and then it is usually for show. Avoids Bookstores In making the investigations for this course, we interviewed many clerks in the bookstores of leading cities throughout the United States. Without exception, they stated that few extremely fat people patronize them. Quote, I have been in this store 17 years, and I have never sold a book to a 250-pounder, one dealer told us. All this is due to the fact with which we started this chapter, that the fat man is built around his stomach, and stomachs do not read. Naturally Realistic The fat man has the child's natural innocence and ignorance of subtle and elusive things. He has the same interest in things and people as does the child. 
the child's indifference to books, lectures, schools, and everything abstract. Physical Assets I believe I could digest nails, exclaimed a fat friend of ours recently. This perfect nutritive system constitutes the greatest physical superiority of the alimentive. So highly developed is his whole stomach department that everything agrees with him, and everything tends to make him fat. As Irvin Cobb recently said, quote, It isn't true that one can't have his cake and eat it too, for the fat man eats his and keeps it all. Physical Liabilities A tendency to overeat results naturally from the highly developed eating and digestive system of this type, but this in turn overtaxes all the vital organs, as stated before. Also, the fat man's aversion to exercise reduces his physical efficiency. The pure alimentive and the alimentively inclined should learn their normal weight and then keep within it if they desire long lives. Social Assets Sweetness of disposition is one of the most valuable of all human characteristics. Fat people possess it more often and more unchangingly than any other type. Other social assets of this type are amiableness, affability, hospitality, and approachableness. Social Liabilities Gaining his ends by flattery, cajolery, and various more or less innocent little deceptions are the only social handicaps of this type. Emotional Assets His unfailing optimism is the most marked emotional quality of this type. Nothing can be so dark that the fat person doesn't find a silver edge somewhere. So, in disaster, we always send for our fat friends. In the presence of an amply proportioned individual, everything looks brighter. Hope springs eternal in the human breasts, but springs are stronger in the plump folks than in the rest of us. Money spending is also a marked feature of the fat man. His emotions are outgoing, never ingrowing. A stingy fat man is unknown. Emotional Liabilities A tendency to become spoiled, to pout, and to take out his resentments in babyish ways are the emotional weaknesses of this type. These, as you will note, are the natural reactions of childhood, from which he never fully emerges. Business Assets The ability to make people like him is the greatest business and professional asset of this type, and one every other type might well emulate. The average-minded fat man near the door of a business establishment will make more customers in a month by his geniality, joviality, and sociableness than a dozen brilliant thinkers will in a year. Every business that deals directly with the public should have at least one fat person in it. Business Liabilities a habit of evading responsibility and of getting out from under constitutes the inclination most harmful to the business or professional ambitions of this type. Again, it is the child in him trying to escape the task set for it and at the same time to avoid punishment. Domestic Strength Love of home is a distinguishing domestic trait of all fat people. The fat man's provision for his family is usually as complete as his circumstances will permit, and he often stretches it a point. As parents, fat men and women are almost too easygoing for their own future happiness, for they spoil their children, but they are more loved by their children than any other type. Being so nearly children themselves, they make equals of their children enter into their games, and live their lives with them. Domestic Weakness Dependence on others, the tendency of allowing oneself to be supported by brothers or sisters or wife, is the chief domestic weakness of fat people. They should begin early in life to depend upon themselves and make it a practice to carry their share of family responsibilities. Should Aim At Developing more of his mental powers with a view 
to using his head to lessen the manual work he so dislikes, and cultivating an interest in the more mature side of the world in which he lives should be two of the aims of all extremely fat people. Should avoid. Letting down. Soft snaps and temptations to evade responsibility should be avoided by the fat. Elbert Herbert said, quote, Blessed is the man who is not looking for a soft snap, for he is the only one who shall find it. This explains why the fat man, unless brainy, seldom lands one. Strongest Points Optimism, hospitality, and harmony are the strongest points in the fat man's nature. Upon them many a man has built a successful life. Without them no individual of any type can hope to be happy. His popularity and all-rounded compatibility give the fat man advantages over other types which fairly compensate for the weak cogs in his machinery. Weakest Points Self-indulgence of all kinds, overeating, oversleeping, under-exercising, and the evasion of responsibilities are the weakest points of this type. Despite his many strong points, his life is often wrecked on these rocks. He so constantly tends to taking the easy way out. Day by day, he gives up chances for ultimate success for the babbles of immediate ease. He is the most likable of all the types, but... His indolence sometimes strains even the love of his family to the breaking point. How to deal with this type socially? Feed him. Give him comfortable chairs, the largest you have, and don't drag him into long discussions of any kind. This is the recipe for winning the fat man when you meet him socially. And whatever you do, don't tell him your troubles. The fat man hates trouble, smothers his own, and you only make him ill at ease when you regale him with yours. Don't walk him any more than is absolutely necessary. Let him go home early if he starts. He enjoys his sleep and doesn't like to have it interfered with. Make your conversation deal with concrete personal things and events. Stay away from highbrow subjects. The best places to eat and the best shows of the week are safe subjects to introduce when with very fat people. How to deal with this type in business? Don't give him hard manual tasks. If you want this kind of work done, get someone other than an extremely fat man to do it. If you hire a fat man, blame yourself for the result. Give your fat employee a chance to deal with people in a not-so-serious way, but hold him strictly to the keeping of his records, reports, and working hours. If this fat person is a dealer, a merchant, or a tradesman, keep him to his word. Start out by letting him know you expect the delivery of just what he promises. Don't let him jolly you into relinquishing what is rightly yours. And keep in mind always that the fat person is usually good at heart. Remember, the chief distinguishing marks of the alimentive in the order of their importance are rounded outlines, immature features, and dimpled hands. A person who has these is largely of the alimentive type, no matter what other types may be included in his makeup. End of Part 2 of chapter 1 Part 1 of chapter 2 of How to Analyze People on Sight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org How to Analyze People on Sight Through the Science of Human Analysis The Five Human Types by Elsie Lincoln Benedict and Ralph Payne Benedict Section 5 of Chapter 2 Chapter 2. The Thoracic Type The Thriller Individuals in whom the circulatory system, heart, arteries, and blood vessels, and the respiratory system, lungs, nose, and chest, are more highly developed than any other systems, have been named the thoracics. This name comes from the fact that the heart and lungs, 
which constitute the most important organs of these two closely allied systems, are housed in the thorax, that little room made by your ribs for the protection of these vital organs. Physical resonance. A general elasticity of structure, a suggestion of sinews and physical resonance, characterize this type. The forehead face, high chest individual. What is known as a red face, when accompanied by a high chest, always signifies large thoracic tendencies. The high color which in an adult comes and goes is a sure indication of a well-developed circulatory system. Since high color is caused by the rapid pumping of blood to the tiny blood vessels of the face. People with little blood, weak hearts or deficient circulation are not for it and must be much overheated or excited to show vivid color in their cheeks. Betray their feelings. On the other hand, the slightest displeasure, enjoyment, surprise or exertion brings the blood washing to the face and neck of him who has a large, well-developed blood system. How many times you have heard such a one say, I am so embarrassed, I flush at every little thing. How I envy the rest of you who come in from a long walk, looking so cool. The Man of Great Chest Expansion The largest part of this man's body is around the chest. See chest free. His chest is high for the reason that he has larger lungs than the average. Advantages of a high chest The man of unusual chest expansion has one great physical asset. The person who breathes deeply has a decided advantage over the man who breathes deficiently. The lungs form the bellows or air supply for the body's engine, the heart, and with a deficient supply of air, the heart does deficient work. Efficient breathing is easy only to the men of large lungs, and only the high-chested have large lungs. Long-waist people. A long waist is another thoracic sign, for it is a natural result of the extra house room required by the large lungs and heart. It is easily detected in both men and women. See chart free. If you are close observer, you have noticed that some people appear to have a waistline much lower than others, that the belt line dividing the upper part of the body from the lower is proportionately much nearer to the floor in some than in others of the same height. Passing of the warp's waist The strict up and down lines of today's woman and the slimsy shoulder to heel garments she wears have obliterated her waistline. But you will recall how differently the old wolf's waist fashions of a score of years ago betrayed the secrets of the short and long waist. The 18-inch belt, of which we were so falsely proud in 1900, told unmistakable facts about milady's thoracic development. Belt versus Suspenders As the telltale belt disappeared from women's wardrobe, it appeared immense and now betray the location of his waist with an exactness of which the old-fashioned suspenders were never guilty. To test yourself, if you are a man and have difficulty in getting ready-made coats long enough for you, that is certain proof that you have decided thoracic tendencies. If you are a woman who has to forgo many a pretty gown because it is not long enough in the waist, the same is true of you. In women, this long waist and high chest give the appearance of small hips and of shoulders a little broader than the average. In men, it gives that strict shoulder-like bearing, which makes this type of man admired and gazed after as he strides down the street. The pure thoracic head. A high head is a significant characteristic of the typical thoracics. See chart 4. The anglo saxons tend to have this head and, more than any other races, exhibit thoracic qualities as racial characteristics. This is considered the handsomest head known. Certainly, it lends the appearance of nobility and intelligence. It is not wide, look at from the front or back, 
but inclines to be slightly narrower for its height than the alimentive head. The kite-shaped face. A face widest through the cheekbones and tapering slightly up the sides of the forehead and downward to the jawbones is the face of the pure thoracic. See chart four. This must not be mistaken for the pointed chin nor the pointed head, but is merely a sloping of the face upward and downward from the cheekbones, as a result of the unusual width of the nose section. See chart four. His well developed nose. The nose section is also high and wide because the typical thoracic has a nose that is well developed. This is shown not only by its length but by its high bridge. The cause for the width and length of this section is obvious. The nose constitutes the entrance and exit departments of the breathing system. Large lung capacity necessitates a large chamber for the intake and expulsion of air. Size of good lungs. Whenever you see a man whose face is wide through the cheekbones, with a long high bridge open nostril nose, you see a man of good lung capacity and of quick physical energy. When you see anyone with pinched nostril, a face that is narrow through the cheekbones with a low or sway back nose, you see a man whose lung capacity is deficient. Such a person invariably expends his physical energy more slowly. Freckles, being due to the same causes as wet hair and high color, are further indication of thoracic tendencies, though you may belong to this type with or without them. The typical thoracic hand. The pointed hand is the hand of the pure thoracic. See chart four. Note the extreme length of the second finger and the pointer effect of this hand when all the fingers are laid together. Any person with a pointer hand such as this has good thoracic development, whether it occupies first place in his makeup or not. The fingers of the thoracic are also inclined to be more thin-skinned than those of other types. One may be predominantly thoracic. Without these elements, but they are indication of the extreme thoracic type. Naturally, the hand of the extreme thoracic is more pink than the average. The beautiful foot. The thoracic tends to have more narrow, high-arched feet than other types. As a result, this type makes the majority of the beautifully short. The man of energetic movements. A hair chicken nimbleness goes with this type. He is always posed ready to strike. All thoracics use their hands, arms, wrists, limbs, and feet alertly and energetically. They open doors, handle implements, and all kind of hand instruments with little blundering. Also, their movements are more graceful than those of other types. The thoracic walk. The springy step must have been invented to describe the walk of the thoracic. No matter how hurried, his walk has more grace than the walk of other types. He does not stumble, and it is seldom that a thoracic steps on the chain of his partner's groan. The graceful sitter. The way you sit tells a great deal about your nature. One of the first secrets it betrays is whether you are by nature graceful or ungainly. The person who sits gracefully. Who seems to drop himself becomingly upon a chair and to arise from it with ease is usually a thoracic. The excess of energy sometimes gives them the appearance of fidgeting, but it is an easy, graceful fidget and not as disturbing as that of other types. Keen eye and ear senses, quick eye and keen ears are characteristics of the thoracics. The millions of stimuli. The sounds, sights, and smells impinging every waking moment upon the human consciousness affect him more quickly and more intensely than any other type. The acuteness of all our senses depends, to a far greater extent than we have hitherto to suppose, upon proper heart and lung action. Take long, deep breaths for five minutes in the open air, 
while walking rapidly enough to make your heart pound, and see how much keener your senses are at the end of that time. The thoracic is chronically in this condition because his heart and lungs are going at top speed habitually and naturally all his life, susceptible to heat. Because bodily temperature varies according to the amount of blood and the rapidity of its circulation, this type is always warmer than others. He is extremely susceptible to heat, suffers keenly in warm rooms or warm weather, and wears fewer wraps in winter. The majority of the buffer at the beaches in summer are largely of this type. The high strung, nerves as dull as a violin string, due to his acute physical senses and his thin sensitive skin, plus his instantaneous quickness, make the thoracic what is known as high strung. The most temperamental, because he is keyed to high C by nature. The thoracic has more of that quality called temperament than any other type. The wreck who said that temperament was mostly temper might have reversed it and still have been right, for temper is largely a matter of temperament. Since the thoracic have more temperament, it follows naturally that they have more temper, or rather that they show it oftener, just as they show their delightful qualities oftener. A continuous performance. This type, consciously and unconsciously, is a continuous performance. He is showing you something of himself every moment, and if you are interested in human nature, as your reading of this book suggests, you are going to find him a fascinating subject. He is expressing his feelings with more or less abandon all the time. And he's likely to express as many as a dozen different ones in as many moments. The quick temper, flying off the handle and going up in the air, are phrases originally inspired by our dear delightful friends, the thoracic. Other types do these more or less temperamental things, but they do not do that as frequently nor on as short notice as this type. The human firefly. A fiery nature is part and parcel of the thoracic makeup, but did you ever see a fiery nature man who didn't have lots of warm friends? It is the grunge, in whom the fire starts slowly and smoulders indefinitely, that nobody likes. But a man who flares up, flames for a moment, and is calm the next, never lacks for companion or devotees. The wet-haired. One may belong to the thoracic type, whether his hair is blond or brunette, or any of the shades between. But it is an interesting fact that most of the red-haired are largely of this type. He didn't have red hair for nothing. Is a famous phrase that has been applied to the red-haired, quick-tempered thoracic for generations. You will be interested to note that this high color and high chest are distinctly noticeable in most of the red hair people you know. Certain proof that they approximate this type. As you walk down the street tomorrow, look at the people ahead of you, and when you find a red hair, notice how much more red his neck is than the necks of the people walking beside him. This flushed skin almost always accompanies red hair. Showing that most red-haired people belong to this type. The flesh in the pan, the red-haired man's temper usually expands itself instantly. His red-hot fierceness is over in a moment. But for every enemy, he has two friends, friends who like his flame, even though in constant danger from it themselves. Whereas the alimentive avoids you if he disagrees with you. The thoracic likes to tell you in a few hot words just what he thinks of you, but the chances are that he will be so completely over it by lunch time that he will invite you out with him. Desire for approbation, to be admired and a wee bit envied, are desires dear to the heart of this type. Everybody, to a larger or lesser degree, desires these things, but to no other type do they mean so much to this one. We know this because no other type, in any such numbers, 
takes the trouble or makes the sacrifice necessary to bring them about. As indicate desires, the ego of every individual craves approval, but the majority of the other types crave something else more. The particular something in each case depending upon the type to which the individual belongs. You can always tell what any individual wants most by what he does. The man who thinks he wants a thing or wishes he wants it talks about getting it, envies those who has it and plans to start doing something about it. But the man who really wants a thing goes after it, sacrifices his leisure, his pleasures, and sometimes love himself and gets it. Shines in public life. The limelight appeals more to this type than to others, because it goes further toward gratifying his desire for approbation. So while other men and women are dreaming of fame, the thoracic practice pulls and pleads his way to it. The personal agitation of the friends and of the multitude is the breath of life to him. Extremes of this type consider no self-denial too great a price to pay for it. Many on the stage. The stage in all its forms is as natural a field to the thoracic as salesmanship is to the alimentive. The pleas of fond papas and fearsome murmurs are usually ineffective with this type of boy or girl when he sets his heart on a career before the foot lies or in the movies. Whether they achieve it or not will depend on other and chiefly mental choice in each individual's make-up. But the yearning for it in some form is always there. So the manager's waiting rooms are always crowded with people of this type. It is this intensity of desire which has gold and inspired most stage artists on to success in their chosen fields. Put yourself in his place. To be able to put one's self in the role of another, to feel as his feel, to be so keenly sensitive to his situation and psychology that one almost becomes that person for the time being, is the heart and soul of acting. The thoracic has this sensitiveness naturally. After long study and acquaintance, you may be able to put yourself in the place of a few friends. The thoracic does this instantly and automatically. Tendency, not toll, makes fame. Those who have succeeded to fame in any given line are wont to proclaim hard work is the secret of success and to take great credit unto themselves for the labor they have expended on their own. It is true, of course, that all success until hard work but the man or woman sufficiently gifted to rise to the heights gets from that gifts such a strong inward urge towards its expression that what he does in that direction is not work to him. The long hours, concentration and study devoted to it are more pleasurable than painful to him. He chooses such activities voluntarily. Nature the Real Artist Nothing can rightly be called work which one does out of sheer preference. Work never made an actress and work never made a singer, where innate talent for this art was lacking. Nature, the true maker of every famous name, bestowed ninety percent and man, if he hustle, can provide the other very necessary ten. But his sense of humor is not his sense of justice should be sufficient to prevent his trying to rob the Almighty of his due. Success for all. Every individual who is not feeble-minded can be a success at some time in this big world. Every normal-minded individual is able to create, invent, improve, organize, build or market some of the myriad of things the world is crying for but he will succeed at only those things in which his physiological and psychological mechanism perform their function easily and naturally. Why we work? Man is, by inclination, very little of a worker. He is first a wanter, a bundle of instincts, second a filler, a hustle of emotions, last and least he is a thinker. 
What will work he does is done not because he likes it, but because it serves one of these first two bundles of instincts. When the desire for leisure is stronger than the other urges, leisure wins. But in all ambitious men and women, the desire for other things outweighs the leisure urge. Ambition and type. Now, what is it that causes some to have ambition and others to lack it? Your ambitions take the form determined by your predominating physiological system. For instance, in every great singer, the thoracic has been present, either as the first or second element. The effect of the physical upon our talents is no more marked anywhere than here, for it is his unusual lung power, his high chest. The sounding box in his nose section and his superior vocal cords that makes the real foundation of every singer's fame. These physiological conditions are found in extreme degree only in persons of thoracic tendencies. It was the great lung power of Caruso that made him a great singer. It was his remarkable heart power that brought him through an illness in February 1921. When every newspaper in the world carried on its front page the positive statement that he could not live another day, that he lived for six months afterwards, was due chiefly to his remarkable heart. The nature resulting from a large heart and large lungs is one distinctly different from all others. In short, the thoracic nature. The best dressed. The best dressed man and the best dressed woman in your town belong predominantly to this type. This is no accident. The thoracic, being possessed of acute eye senses, are more sensitive to color and light than any other type. These are the foundation of style and artistic grooming. Clothes can unmake the man. Being desirous of the approval of others and realizing that though clothes do not make the man. They can unmake him. This type looks to his laurel on this point, because clothes determine the first impression we make upon strangers, and because that impression is difficult to change. Clothes are of vast importance in this maze of human relationships. The thoracic is more sensitive to the attitude of others, because that attitude is more vital to his self-expression. He senses from childhood the bearing that clothes have for or against him in the opinion of others, and how they can aid him to express his personality. The glass of fashion, the thoracic therefore often become the glass of fashion and the mold of form. His consciousness of himself is so keen that even when alone, he prefers those things in dress which are at once fine, fancy, and fashionable. Some types are indifferent to clothes, some ignorant of clothes, and some deviant in their clothes. But the thoracic always have the keen sense of fitness in the matter of apparel. Distinction in dress: the distinctive dresser is one who essays the extremely fashionable, the last moment touch. He is always a step or two ahead of the times. His ties, handbags, handkerchiefs, and stick pins are up to the minute. Such a man or woman invariably has a large thoracic development, and is well repaid by the public for his pains. Just the universal language, the public looks more eagerly than we suppose to changes in styles and fads. It gives, in spite of itself, instantaneous admiration of a sort. To those who follow the dictates of fashion, this being one of the quickest roads to adulation, it is often utilized by this type. The newest in hair dressing, the latest thing in croppers, is always known by the thoracic woman, and because she is more often than any other type a beautiful woman, she can wear her hair in almost any style and find it becoming. So when puffs were the thing. This type of woman not only wore puffs, but the most extreme and numerous puffs. When the sticking to the face style was in vogue, she bought much bandoline and essayed the slickest and shiniest hair of all. When the ear bun raged, 
she changed those same paper-like curves overnight into veritable young sofa cushions, always on dress parade. With intent to keep the spotlight on himself, the thoracic is always on dress parade. 